do algorithms dream of electronic shapes? Packaged goods. Musical keyboard. Outerwear. Dog. Dog. Coffee cup. Food. Person. 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 Person, person, unknown, 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 window, clothing, necklace, necklace, necklace. Did you want to say anything? No, I'm going to do the intro. So, are we, are we on? We are on. And it's recording. We have to share it, yeah. But we've both had COVID on this side. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've shared a mic before. So. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the beauty about being online uh, in real life and broadcasting is I have no idea where I should be looking. So I'm going to look straight into the camera. Um, my name is Fih Machnil. I'm CEO of the Digital Hub. And you're all very welcome this afternoon uh, and our panel discussion marking Robin Price's public artwork, Do Algorithms Dream of Electronic Shapes? We are with you both in real life and in real time and broadcasting online from the learning studio here at the Digital Hub. Looking behind us, right behind me here is Bridgeford Street and the soon to be opening public park with the river Liffey due north of that. So we are situated in the heart of the Liberties on Thomas Street. The Digital Hub is one of Ireland's largest and most diverse cluster of technology and creative industry campus. We also have a role to play in the local community. We are collaborating closely with the Land Development Agency in realizing and regenerating this historic quarter to support a sustainable living and working community with housing solutions, creative and working spaces, and celebrating public realm. We often find ourselves at the intersection of art and technology as we have a long-standing commitment to supporting technologists, entrepreneurs, and artists in both interrogating and trying to solve societal challenges. We have an annual Artists in Residence program, among many other projects, such as the Liberate Music Project in collaboration with BIM, uh, and the Screen Aid program in collaboration with Dublin International Film Festival. More on that on our website. Our artist residency program invites artists to bring their perspective and inquiry to the life of the Digital Hub and Dublin 8. We invite them to interrogate what we do and what we should do within our community. Last year, for instance, the artist Elaine Hoey curated a series of talks in partnership with the National College of Art and Design, our neighbors down the road, on the impact of virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and algorithms and machine learning on the making of art and the challenges therein of bias and ethics. You can find these curated talks also on our website. The Digital Hub has a legal responsibility in terms of data and data protection. One of the great programs we have is a Smart D8 program, which is a part of the Smart City program that's organized and managed by Dublin City Council. This is a multi partner approach to supporting the health and well-being of the Dublin 8 community, 
through our understanding and analysis of collected data, and in turn, how we can translate these into solutions using IoT applications uh, and other technology solutions. It is in this context that we invited Robin Price to intervene and create an artwork that may guide us or warn us or prepare us for any future consequences regarding the use of data. And at this point, we will show a video which Robin produced by way of the context for this panel discussion. All right, you're okay. Yeah. Robin's going to pull on up. Do algorithms dream of electronic shapes? It's a nonsense question, really. And one I shamelessly adapted from science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, who famously asked, Do androids dream of electric sheep? He was inspired to ask this by the way that even 50 years ago, technology was starting to give our environment the appearance of being somehow intelligent and alive. We don't have androids yet. But Dublin and Dublin 8, already commercially a technology hub, is now civically becoming a smart city. This means collecting even more data and connecting people and institutions in new electronic ways to allow algorithms to guide decisions in the hope that this is good and useful. It's too early to say what the effects of this will be. So this project looks at some of the data we already give away and reflects on how this has shifted society now. Many of us share our lives to some degree online, uploading images throughout the day to companies that sit close to D8. This work imagines what if Dublin's servers and data centers really were intelligent and alive? Watching us by day and trying to make sense of us by dreaming at night? What might these electronic dreams fed from our data look like? Perhaps just as in real life what we see in person might differ from what is displayed online? Do algorithms dream of electronic shapes takes a random selection of Dublin's social media posted by day and feeds them through an artificial intelligence at night to ask what the computers see in us? Drawing out these digital dreams with laser beams examining what biases have we already trained into these algorithms and how has the ability to share and perform our lives through curated displays of imagery changed us? What is it the computers see in us? What is it we imagine we see in technology? And how much is it all just a matter of projection? Are we back on live? Yeah. So we, we will share that link. It's, all, it's also on our website. We'll share that link. So to move on, to remind everyone that we are recording this discussion and it will be available also on our website <clears throat> along with, uh, with Robin's video. Secondly, if anyone uh, online wishes to ask a question later, do this through the chat function of, uh, of Zoom. So the panel this afternoon are, and we're welcome, Abibi Burhane. Abiba is a senior fellow at Mozilla and a cognitive science PhD researcher at the Complex Software Lab in the School of Computer Science at UCD, where interdisciplinary research sits at the intersection of complex adaptive systems, machine learning, and critical race studies. Abiba is an expert in the ethics of the application of algorithms and machine learning. From Macau uh, is Professor Hans Georg Muller. Uh, he, ha, Georg is a professor of philosophy at the University of Macau. His re research on the way social media has accelerated a shift and how we conceive of ourselves and our identity draws both from the systems theory of Lumen and from the ancient Taoist philosophy of the Zongzi. Ashing Murray is a freelance curator interested in work at the intersection of art and science or indeed artistic works informed by scientific issues. 
She is also interested in socially engaged work, activism, and immersive technologies. Prior to her freelance career, Ashling worked as head of program at the Science Gallery for the last 10 years. And finally, Robin Price, who now is sitting on his, on his chair here, is an artist inventor, technologist, technician, transdisciplinary physicist, musician, cat enthusiast, and what's not here as well is snowboarder. He uses electronics, algorithms, code, glitches, and hacked objects to push at the boundaries of what is technologically possible, permissible, and ethical. And his approach is playful, experimental, and publicly engaged. So now, Robin, can I ask you to start off with, uh, we gave you a, a, a brief to respond to double nation and to respond to our responsibility, indeed our engagement with data. How, how did your work emerge? Um, out of, well, so originally I was sort of looking to work with the data streams that might have been being generated, but there weren't any. So I had to sort of pivot and think about like what data streams there were just sort of out there and because Dublin's home to Facebook and Google and lots of things started, I thought it made sense and they're geographically close uh, was to work with those those data streams, all the sort of stuff that we upload. But then also sort of looking back at the original brief around the idea of smart cities, uh, when I started sort of reading up on that, um, I got sort of drawn into the into the Philip K. Dick stuff. He gave this really interesting talk called The Android and the Human. He was saying even back in the 70s, uh, when they invented sort of uh, microchip technology and sort of things started to get more and more rapidly automated, that it was giving you know, all these sort of things blinking, lights blinking, sort of motors whirring, things started to look um, like they were intelligent and alive. Um, and that people were sort of starting to project the, the idea of intelligence onto um, inanimate objects. And I sort of, yeah, I got interested in that. And then the idea of well, what, what if, what if, so what if those, you know, obviously they're not really intelligent and alive, but what if they were, like we feed these machines lots and lots of data. Um, what would they, how would they make sense of us of trying to consider, uh, sort of consider things from a, the sort of playful, fictitious idea of the computer's eye view. They sort of sit there viewing everything that we upload. Um, and like, why would you do that? And I think the idea was to sort of try and point out sort of playfully and sort of in a silly way that the inadequacies of it, so that the flattening effect of, of those, of that sort of artificial intelligence, that the, the emphasis is more on the artificial than the, the intelligence. So sort of feeding it, I think I fed the algorithm. Um, so it's feeding social media images that I was scraping off Instagram into the Google AI, Google Vision AI. I fed it about sort of 2,000 images from, from Dublin, but it, it abstracted that down to about 100 classifiers. So there's a sort of rich visual imagery, and every image is, is sort of very different and tells, um, you know, you, you, I think a human looking at it would get sort of very sort of different resonances, obviously. So seeing things from the computer's point of view, although it's sort of a silly and made up kind of expect, sort of thought experiment to do, I, I thought was an interesting way of looking at um, perhaps the, the limitations of, of, of that, of AI, and, and sort of teasing that out a bit. And, the, and then I also sort of got started to get interested in sort of what, how did these data sets, like when it sort of, so the question I was asking the Google AI was like, what's the thing it's most confident of seeing? So you feed it an image and it'll feed you back um, a list of things that it thinks it's seen and a confidence score for each. Um, and I was just sort of categorizing the images by um, the thing it was most confident of seeing, and then using another piece of like sort of attempt, our attempt at teaching computers to think like humans, which is the, the natural language toolkit. So it's like teaching computers semantic meaning in Python so it can pass sentences. And again, like and using those sort of order, these dream sequences um, by trying to find the closest conceptual link. And again, it would make really odd sort of choices in how it would group these things, which I found um, when interesting. You say, when you say odd choices, did you not preempt these choices? Well, in as far as like, I wrote the software, um, but you're, you're doing it with the best tools that you can find. So I think it, it's right to sort of say, well, you know, you set this thing up almost to fail, like sort of, to point out what you think of as inadequacy. But I tried really hard to sort of um, 
try and make it as rich as it as it could be, or, or use use it in the spirit in which it is written to some extent. I think in reality, those tools, so say something like the natural language toolkit, in reality, it's been useful for like stock markets. People will use it to analyze business reports quicker than a human could read it to say, like, is this broadly positive or is this broadly negative? And then make investment choices quicker than a human would sort of try and preempt the market and, um, and make money that way. Um, and I think with the Google AI, I, it sort of, in terms of what it, it saw and what it was certain of, what I found really interesting, a number of times, it would keep kept mistaking fingernails for packaged goods. It seemed obsessed with packaged goods. So I'm like, what 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 has that data set been trained on so so much that it is it, it just sees ob, sort of yeah, packaged goods, sort of commodity objects in 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 human hands quite often. Um, so it was more in the bits where or, or there'd be something else really really obvious. In the in the in the photo, but it was drawn to like the little thing in the corner, because that was the one that sort of um, confirmed best to the data set that it had been fed fed with. That I found interesting, and this idea that it it could sort of yeah attribute a confidence value to these things. And it's like we sort of reinvented a metaphysical space for platonic ideals in some sense yeah but also you 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 had some values you we look when we discussed this oh, yes, uh, yeah. around say not uh, not uh, projecting images of children yeah. not, uh, tell me about that how did you and i'll use this word carefully how did you manipulate that well i think because you had did you or was a program no so the and then uh, this is another thing that came out of it was that the I didn't trust the, there was a lot of things. Although the idea was the installation would just run itself. When in actual practice, I was like it, it couldn't because I didn't trust it to. Um, which I think is another sort of thing that I, this idea of like sort of smart cities and automation. There's not ever going to be a role where you sort of completely engineer out the role for people to make intelligent decisions because computers are idiots. Um, so I decided when I was working with the Instagram feeds, I sort of I would curate what what got used, even though you never saw the image in person because it was drawing out these long exposure um, frames, which was sort of for for a variety of reasons, both because I didn't think it was ethical to like blast people's pictures, also I couldn't with the laser, um, and I had an sort of prior interest in in long exposure. I set myself like the sort of ethical dimension of just working with sort of pictures of not of dead people, not of, not of children, because they couldn't sort of in any way meaningfully consent, even though everybody else sort of hadn't, but it, those images were public in some sense. And I thought it was analogous to, like when you download, when you view Instagram on your, on your on a, say a web browser, um, you're using a third party piece of software to process that image to see it and you're downloading it. And I would say at a stretch, that's what I'm doing. I'm using a third party piece of software to process that image. Uh, and display it. So I think it's within within the bounds just of, 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 of what's ethical. But then also I think it's sort of a, uh, an odd question because like the images are all there. You could go and see them in their original. They're all things that people have sort of publicly put up. They want in some sense to be seen. That's that's what how they how they want to be seen. So the idea that you could sort of complain about it being seen <laughs> seems quite old. But I recognize that people didn't, you know, they didn't say it's okay to then feed that to the Google AI and ask what the computer sees in that. And it's you know, they might potentially have objected to that then being sort of re-photographed. But I felt that sort of within the art world, there's a long history of sort of appropriation and collage and, and remix that I could at least, if not legally, sort of historically draw on some antecedent argument as to why that was a, a valid way of, of, of working. Um, but you never really, I mean, I think the conversation we had with the lawyers was, or at least we'll have an interesting conversation <laughs> at the end of it. We'll come to that later. <laughs> okay, so in preparation for the panel discussion, I had asked uh, and invited uh, Abiba and Ashling and Georg to give a kind of initial reaction to uh, Robin's work. Uh, some of us may have seen it physically, some of us may see it online. So I'll go straight to Macau first and Georg and ask Georg for your initial response to Robin's work and we'll do a round table on that and then, uh, then we'll take it from after that. Georg. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, 
introducing Robin's work to me, uh, I find it quite fascinating. Uh, of course, I could only watch it online. Um, so I think like uh, Robin's questions, do algorithms dream, which he then visualizes in the art project, uh, reminds me of uh, a traditional folk tale, the uh, Snow White story, where you have this mirror, this magic mirror uh, that reflects uh, images in two, way, two senses of the word reflect, right? It reflects the image and it somehow has a consciousness and has a cap capacity to somehow uh, in a conscious way reflect on it. Uh, so I think there's a double similarity between mirrors and algorithms that is shown in Robin's work. Uh, number one, that uh, these are objects that show our, our identity, how it is seen from the outside, how it is seen somehow in public. And that's something that we cannot directly see. So it shows us how we are being seen. So we look at second order observation, right? We look at how an observer observes us. Um, and then uh, secondly, uh, in comparison with the magic mirror, uh, both Robin's work and the magic mirror uh, somehow adds consciousness to that observation, to this technical, technological object that somehow observes us. So that's, that's um, an Im Im imaginatory uh, transformation of that object. Uh, of course, I think there's a big difference between traditional mirrors and algorithms. Like in the mirrors, traditionally, in the fairy tale, we basically see ourselves how we appear in our social roles to our immediate peers, whatever, our family members or uh, whatever, if I'm a professor and then I, I check if my whatever uh, tie is correct before I, I go to class, things like this, right, with my hairstyle is proper. Uh, so in this way, the, the, the mirror represents the gaze uh, of the peers that are present. But of course, the algorithms don't do that. They have a much, much wider gaze. They represent the gaze of what I like to call the general peer, people who we don't know, people who we've never met, and who probably we will never meet. Uh, and then, of course, it doesn't just show our face, the algorithm, like unlike the mirror, but it shows our profile. So that includes our taste, our interests, what we like and don't like, our opinions, whatever, what we eat, uh, how cool we are, and all these kinds of things that we cannot really see in a mirror. And then, very importantly, the algorithms, unlike the mirror, also point to the future. So they just not, don't only show us in the present. So they basically tell us what we will buy, they show us what we will buy, they show us what we will watch, they show us whom we will meet, maybe they even show us those who will have, we will have sex with or something like this, they show us who we will vote for, and so forth. So they're much more powerful than, um, than the traditional mirror. Um, and then, uh, when, I, when I say one more thing, uh, that they, they, they also pr present us with like a big challenge, right, that we have to live up to this image, right, if you look in the mirror, and then you, you go away, and then you know you have to live up to this image that the mirror, that you've seen in the mirror, and similarly, the algorithm basically shows us that profile, that that we will uh, have to live up to and again like i think robin just uh, shows us this kind of human fantasy that the that the mirror and or the algorithm is actually human that it actually thinks and speak which of course in reality uh, it isn't but we somehow fantasize that that it somehow is or or should be Georg, thank you. And I, I will come back to interrogate with you the, uh, the sense of what authenticity means, what reality means and pretending means within, within the social media perspective that Robin has raised. Abiba, could you give us your initial kind of reflections on Robin's work and how you perceived it, please? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and um, I haven't I haven't seen the exhibition in person either. I have only watched the the video. Uh, I found it really thought provoking, and witty, and uh, and really smart, as as Robin said himself. 
this is I, I was watching it thinking I wish I had you know an artistic perspective like this because that kind of artistic approach really uh, you know bring forth important messages uh, which is that uh, which is the whole idea of uh, you know um, how algorithms kind of create a sense of identity, digital identity, uh, kind of taken from the various data traces that we leave behind. And I think that's a powerful message. Uh, and of course, coming from you know, the, the ethics of AI perspective, I was immediately, my attention was immediately drawn to, you know, uh, as, as Robin himself said, the question of, you know, privacy, the question of, you know, the rights of the person who, who posted on, who posted those images on social media. Uh, and these are questions I myself struggle with in my own research. Uh, and these are also questions I don't, I don't have the answer for, and I don't think many people have the answer for. Uh, for example, I've been working uh, recently uh, with, um, image data sets, large scale image data sets and multimodal data sets where myself and my colleagues mainly kind of do audit work, kind of critical assessment of what's in the data set, how are you know certain groups and certain individuals represented, what's you know the kind of what's the kind of content that's found in these data sets and you find especially in vision data sets you find there are so many images that shouldn't be there. I know, Robin, you excluded images of children or deceased people, but that's not the case for many vision data sets. Uh, so you find, you know, images of children, even, even ImageNet, which is supposedly one of the gold standard, the best data sets we have for training computer vision systems. In my audit with collaborators, we found that it contains images of children. Um, so this then brings off the, the, the question of consent, consent and even awareness. Most people who end up in these huge data sets, they don't know, they don't even know that their, their images or their data is being, has ended up in a huge data set and they don't know that uh, their data is being used to train and validate algorithmic systems. So I, I, I liked your, you know, sensitive and kind of aware approach towards, uh, towards those issues. Um, and I guess I, and the comment you just made uh, at the opening, uh, uh, just in, in this panel at the opening session, that uh, computers are stupid. Uh, I wish you had made, I wish that was clear in, in throughout your exhibition because that is, that is the message that's often lost <laughs> as we are, <laughs> because we do think of computers as if they are magical, as if they know everything, as if they can make sense of you know, humanity, as if they can make sense of us. Uh, it, that's not the case. Uh, they can only do, you know, classification. They can only do very specific tasks. Even recognizing uh, an image, which is supposed to be currently one of, you know, the great advancements of computer vision, it's not an easy task. Take, for example, you know, give 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 a vision system uh, an image with so many uh, images, so many uh, content in the background. Uh, it will struggle because most systems are trained to recognize just one system. So things that we take for granted, things we take that as common sense. For example, you see an image. Um, uh, this is one of the famous examples from Melanie Mitchell's book. Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the most uh, rigorous researcher uh, with an, with her computer vision. She gives she provides this image where. You have a lady pushing a buggy with a baby inside it. And on the other hand, she has a dog on a leash. In the background is there is a man walking you know, on the opposite side of her. And on the image, you can only see the, his upper body, not, not the lower body. So for, for us humans, because we have common sense, we understand, even though we can't see the lower body of the man, we can still extrapolate that you know, the man has legs and he's walking. This is not, these are things that are not clear for vision systems. These are, these are things that, you know, AI still struggles with. So we do give so much credit to our AIs than, than, than what's reality. Um, 
so these are these are points I wish uh, that have been uh, kind of more emphasized. Uh, but uh, in any case, I, I really I really enjoyed the show. And another thing that came to my mind as I was watching the the video was the fact that um, we have to. It's important to think of you know AI systems algorithms as necessarily embedded within you know, within a business model, you know, whether you look at Google or Facebook or Twitter or Microsoft or any, any, any big take or, you know, not so big take, uh, the business model, which is maximizing profit is the driving force behind any human classification, any algorithmic development, any assessment of human behavior. So uh, any classification or any understanding of human behavior modeled into algorithms or driven from algorithms is inherently intertwined by you know what can we sell how can we make the most amount of money so these are things that you know that go hand in hand in uh, in in, in um, how human beings are modeled and in how the tech world kind of uh, uh, kind of progresses so uh, yeah, that's that's an important. Thank you, uh, thank you, Abiba, and that <clears throat> it 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 made me understand because we had a lot. We'll discuss this later around our responsibility, and in fact, I'd be interested to hear Ashling's view on this later uh, around the increasing awareness of our responsibility that the human has to uh, uh, manipulate the machine uh, in order to, and therefore bias and and values around that. And, and I know Abiba has has written and spoken about that, and we we will we'll have that discussion later. So finally, Ashling, uh, you know, tell us how you approached and how you viewed uh, Robin's artwork. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, Robin, as you know, I'm a big fan of your work. I am. Um, and I agree with, absolutely with, with what the other said there. I think what was really interesting for me, there were several things that were really interesting about this project. I think the facts that you set out initially to start with the data set created by the D8 smart, city, smart cities, yeah. Um, but then when the data hadn't yet been gathered, you decided to kind of take this speculative approach. That's something that I find really fascinating because I think within the kind of safe in inverted commas, confines of art, you're able to try out these kind of speculative futures and test things. And in particular in Ireland, um, where there are all of these big com um, tech companies, where in the past kind of two years, we've been new national digital strategy. Over the summer, there was an artificial intelligence strategy published to, to position Ireland as an international leader within artificial intelligence. I feel like artworks like this can be a kind of uh, a, f a form of uh, public engagement to educate people that they can begin to question the ethics of these things and understand a little bit more of the technologies that are in use and that are going to be coming down the track. Um, aesthetically, I loved it. <laughs> and, and I also loved that it was in person. So I got to see it in person because I'm in Dublin um, and online. And I think, you know, something that really came out of the pandemic was um, accessibility for people. So the fact that it had this Instagram feed that you could visit it and in many ways, experiences as well as you could or even see the scale and spectacle of the way that you experience it in person because it's very impressive in person it's this huge projection on this big tower like you don't really see artworks like that around Dublin city you know um so so I think aesthetically that was really interesting and then the use of the laser um which kind of to me felt like a little nod then to all these pixels making up you know what could be a data set and um, but also on the brick then it looking even more pixelated it kind of felt staticky like a nod to old technologies mm -hmm. um, um, so I, yeah, aesthetically, I really I thought it was beautiful and really, uh, really impressive. It also raised a, a lot of questions for me as well. And um, I suppose, you know, you've spoken through there a little bit and uh, uh, Abeba's final point there as well the entwined human element. I feel like there's a lot of invisible labor when we talk about artificial intelligence. Like we talk about it as though it's totally autonomous and it's not. So you put like, first of all, you decided on certain values and you put those in place and then you manually went through and did those. This wasn't an intelligence that was doing it completely independently. So that's really fascinating. And also I think, you know, within artistic practice, if you're going to be using these new te technologies and using AI as a creative tool, at what point do you set out those values and put in place a kind of guidelines for yourself? There was um, 
there was a group a few years ago called Trust Me, I'm an Artist, led by Anna Dimitru. And it was primarily concerned with bio art, but they set to try and put together a set of guidelines for good science and art collaboration. And I think, you know, like you said, remixing, sampling, collage, none of those things are new. And like these things are in the public realm. However, increasingly, as people are more concerned and should be and interested in what happens to their data, like looking at how we can have more of an ethical approach and is that having you know uh, an ethical panel so like if this was a science research project and it's not importantly because it's like <laughs> lots of provocative questions but if it was you would have an ethics panel where you would have to kind of you know ask questions and put these guidelines in place so yeah i mean it's yeah it, it raised a lot of questions and was super interesting yeah <laughs> I mean, I think, is it ethical <laughs> <laughs> make art that and how you know, well, I mean, it does raise a lot of issues. It raises a lot of issues around the fact that uh, Instagram uh, has every right to, uh, to to that data, and, and perhaps a third party doesn't. So, I mean, how? What's your view as a curator regarding that? Uh, mm. I think it's an interesting one and like, and for me like a lot of very interesting art it treads a very thin line. <laughs> um, so you know, I mean, do, can we justify it because it's art? I, th I think you can justify it because it's art, but I do think increasingly we need to think about the way that data is used even in artistic practice, but it can allow you to really like tease out and test ideas that you wouldn't be able to otherwise, you know, and there's been some really interesting examples like there are artists like Anna Riddler and Caroline Sinders who are creating their own ana analog um, data sets. So Caroline Sinders has a feminist data set that she creates through workshops and um, in an analog way. That's a really fascinating way to even just teach people about the way these things come together. Together. Um, or you have, say, Jake Yules, who has a series called Queering the Data Set, which is where he takes his existing data sets and introduces like non binary and queer faces into it so that it's providing a more uh, rounded and a more representative data set for people. So it's, I mean, is it ethical? I don't have a definitive answer on that, <laughs> um, but I think it's I think it's a, a good thing to explore through art. You know the, the ethics of these things definitely. I mean, artists do intervene both in the social, economic, and kind of cultural space. Mm. They break rules. They push mm. rules. Uh, we have data protection legislation in this country, uh, indeed in Europe. There are more is coming down the line. We have a responsibility to the individual about personal freedom, personal space. Um, can I ask Robin, and maybe Ashley, you can join here. Did you think this through in terms of, 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 of approaching, uh, approaching, uh, approaching this, this, this public artwork? Yeah, I did. I think I sort of, uh, I was just like, it's, it's online anyway. So it's sort of, it's sort of a moot point. Like it, the, by posting it in sort of on Instagram, Instagram, they, they have like an embed code. So like you can embed those images on a third party website so and you kind of know that you're doing that and again like it's all right it's hosted on instagram so but it just seems such a thin shade of so what's the difference between that and then taking a photograph of of the, it didn't it didn't keep me up at night very much i think if it had been things that if it had been like sort of say cctv or something like that where they didn't know or if it was like some app that you had on your phone you weren't really aware of all the all the data that it was also sucking off your phone but the fact this idea that these are images that people have this is how they want to be seen this is like what you're putting out because you want other people to see you that way. This is like the story that you're telling about yourself. That made me feel fairly comfortable in appropriating it. I mean, I think, well, I've done, I did a similar project years ago when I, when I cause it was just for my PhD. I didn't really have to sort of, <laughs> didn't have a Zoom call with lawyers just before <laughs> thinking about GDPR. I did a project um, taking people's YouTube vlogs and remixing those. Um, and then, but then as part of the process, letting them know, like commenting on their vlog that I borrowed their vlog and mashed it up with a load of other vlogs to make these like hybrid kind of weird beatboxy videos. And the, what was interesting there was more, more interesting than the, the, the videos themselves was the comments that that then generated with like, some people because they really, ident really strongly identified with their content. And it was like, well, you've taken your content, therefore you've, you've taken my thoughts as what one person is, this is part of me. And the people were just confused by it. Um, but yeah, it got some really strong sort of reactions either way. But um, so I, I think I was aware that potentially, but we, I didn't, like I, I didn't, I, I left because I think, yeah, kids, they don't know they're being photographed. Mm. 
So that was where I sort of drew the line. Um, so actually, are you, are you, are you, is it a, when, when you, as a curator, as in you, we were we invited Robin to do this, <clears throat> is it a, on a case by case basis in terms of what the ethical approach may be around where you, whether you are transgressing particular? Yeah, stuff? I mean, so certainly in any of the work that I've shown, I suppose it would be a case by case basis. I would argue yeah, there, there could be a better um, maybe guideline framework um, for, for the use of data in, in our works like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was one piece that we showed previously in Science Gallery, <clears throat> which uh, terribly I can't recall the name of, but it was was um, the hard disk of um, an artist whose brother had passed away and he um, then came across this hard disk that had all of this information, all its text messages and everything on it. And it sounds kind of straightforward, like the whole, you know, it was supposed to be about the kind of the digital that you leave behind when you pass away. And we actually ended up having a huge ethics meeting about it, about, you know, the brother didn't know that his the deceased brother didn't know that the artist was going to put this on display and so was this ethical for us to put it on display in the gallery because essentially this person hadn't consented and um, now in the end we ended up coming to the decision that it was you know okay to put on display in the gallery we spoke to the artist at length we spoke to kind of legal we spoke to ethics teams and um, i think that the only piece that we that i ever kind of came to the decision that we wouldn't display which actually ended up being for legal reasons was a piece by nicholas margaret called the pirate cinema which which would um, tune into the network to see the top 100 films that were being downloaded at any moment, and then it would live stream those. So essentially, we weren't live streaming them, but they were being illegally um, streamed, or sorry, we were live streaming them, but uh, we weren't illegally downloading them. It was being done by other, uh, other people. However, when we kind of consulted with uh, legal, it was deemed that it was possible for us to, to actually put this on. Um, so I, I think a case by case basis and really seeing, you know, what the responsibility can be on yes, curators and on cultural spaces to um, show works like this so that you can have these kind of conversations. Yeah, and the way we approached it uh, truthfully was to have a privacy statement and, and a reactive process whereby if there were people who felt transgressed in any way, it was borderline that we would then respond to that in a very quick way. And Robin and I, we spoke, we got legal advice. Yeah. But it was, you know, it, it felt like unchartered, both legal and artistic, yeah. ethical issues. Uh, and, and it's where it definitely veers much more into, you know, the, the way that you would approach um, science research as well. And that this is, the, I guess, the nature of kind of multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary projects or pro projects using kind of um, new technologies. And um, I think that the way that you framed it on the website was really well done. And I think that that's a big part of it in kind of using data for these artworks is also you know uh, looking at the way that the collection of the data that is being used is framed in the artwork and that's done really well on the website um, yeah okay so Abiba I'd like to invite you back into this conversation particularly your own a sense of the, the unintended consequence of technologies like AI and machine learning and how <clears throat> I suppose the issues of ethics and values somehow are, are really extraordinarily important and are, shouldn't be taken, you know, shouldn't be taken for granted as something that's neutral. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. So before I jump onto the unintended consequences of technology, may I just quickly add on, on the borderline, is it ethical or not to use uh, people's posts uh, for, for artistic projects like this? Uh, the research community, for sure, whether it's NLP or vision or any other research, this is this is a question that everybody is kind of grappling with. Is it okay to use people's you know content as and curate it as a data set that's then used to train AI systems, or should we ask you know for explicit consent and should people be aware that you know that this is happening? So it's it's an ongoing debate and. I will just add my own view that I tend to think that, you know, people posting, you know, whether it's, you know, textual content, whether it's images, people posting those on social media is one thing, but using that data for something else is another thing. So I tend to think that we require, we should, this is not the norm, obviously, you know, the norm currently seems to be, if it's out there, we should just, you know, grab it and use it for whatever. Uh, and kind of pushing back against this kind of very widely spread norm seems a bit of an uphill, you know, battle sometimes. Uh, and of course, people will have completely different view than, than I have. 
but just adding my my kind of almost radical view uh, is that people should be again i'm speaking from the research point uh, from the artistic point this project has a different view a, a different purpose which is much more positive which is bringing awareness to you know the impacts of smart cities whereas on the on the research side it should it it, it tends to be you know we are training this model so we need huge amounts of data so we'll take this data and use it so Keeping all these differences in mind, uh, I, I think uh, we should at least strive to for kind of uh, uh, for a practice that takes that makes sure that you know asking for consent and making people that aware that their data is being used uh, as somewhat the norm should be something we should strive for. So I'll, I'll uh, now I will quickly uh, cover the unintended consequences so i again i have a very radical view i tend to think even the very phrasing unintended consequences is problematic because uh -huh. <laughs> because i have i have so far worked on he, three big uh, large scale data sets two vision one multimodal and a lot of people have done so much research especially in data sets and auditing algorithms and the result and the finding is you know, it's robust, you find the same result again and again and again and again, which is that data sets and algorithms where when we don't delve in and do critical assessment and when we don't when we don't go in and do the actual work of mitigating the biases, you know, problematic associations, stereotypical labeling, inclusion of slurs, you name it, you know, uh, all kinds of problems. When we don't delve in and correct this, when we don't delve in and do all the mitigating uh, practices, unless we have done this, we can't guarantee that any data set will, will, will be biased, will end up in discriminatory practices, will embed historically and socially discriminatory and uh, you know, racist, sexist labels of individuals and groups, mostly marginalized groups. And the algorithms we develop based on those, those data sets are not gonna do any better, obviously, because you know, the data is problematic. So we can guarantee that all data sets, all models have problems. So we, if the assumption, if the starting point is that, then we don't talk about unintended consequences because it's, because we know that, you know, <laughs> because we know that unless we do the work, it's going to be problematic. So it will just be a consequence. So my thinking is, is that, you know, we will always have problems. So we have to actively work. We have to actively clean data sets. We have to actively improve uh, and test and, and make sure that algorithms are working. Unless we, make, we go and make sure that they are working, algorithms will always fail. And when they fail, they will mostly fail people at the margins of society. And this is this is something that we are, especially over the last few years, this is something we are seeing with research coming out again and again and again, including my own research. It, that's very interesting. It makes sense what we're saying, and, and uh, if what Ashing is saying too, is that the, in the intention of, particularly what we're talking about today, the intention of the artwork has to be really clear, really evidential from the beginning. The intention has to be laid out so that, so that actually, uh, what, what Aviv is saying is it is intended consequences. I mean, our own bias and our own values, whether it's subconscious or not, is intentional or is certainly like hardwired in and then we have to test that. We have to be sure that whatever we do, uh, it, 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 we, we have to take responsibility for it, essentially. Ashling, would you have, want to add to that? Yeah, I completely agree with everything that Abeba just said. And and I would just add, you know, to, to the piece you were saying earlier about the entwined human element. It's the same um, with intended con consequences. I would say the same about the use of the word bias, um, which was the, the last show that we did in, in, in Science Gallery Dublin. Um, but with bias, you know, we talk about it when it comes to algorithms, or artificial intelligence. Again, it's not this independent thing. Like humans, like new technologies are embedded with human values and encoded with human kind of predispositions in the same way that any human is biased, any kind of machine will be. So we kind of constantly have to return in the same way that like, you know, history is constantly evolving in the way that, that story is constantly evolving. I think we constantly have to kind of come back and check these things and just be, be very clear on what, what our intention is. Georg, I'd like to invite you in <clears throat> and particularly to talk about the Taoist idea of 
genuine pretending. Uh, and I suppose my emerging understanding around authenticity or the perception of authenticity filtered through social media. Uh, you've written about this, you've written about the double bind. Could you, could you maybe uh, contribute to that conversation? Uh, thanks. Uh, these are a lot of questions, but I'd like to do the same as Abiba and maybe uh, first comment a little bit on the discussion that was going on. Um, uh, I found it interesting and good, very valuable that Abiba was pointing out um, uh, the capitalist interest between, behind everything that's going on, right? Everything is is about private property and turning all these data somehow into private property. Now, the ethics question, interestingly enough, I think operates on the exact same logic because uh, it's, it's also about the protection of private property, right? What happens on, on, on social media, at least in my understanding, is profiling. We build an identity in the form of a profile, which basically follows the model of the brand, right? So basically what people do on social media is they build their identity in the form of some form of personal brand. And that totally reflects this, this, this emphasis that we see now on privacy is I think it's a kind of an emphasis on the right to the private property I have to my private brand. So I think this the, the logic, even though there seems to be like uh, at first sight somehow contradictory, I think they're not at all contradictory. They're both based on the same on the same kind of branding and private property logic. And I think that's also very clear, right? These um, the the particularly social media, they are basically a technology like a mirror uh, to enhance the effectiveness and to enhance your your identity to make your identity more effective and in order that you can more intensely identify with it and it is the same it's the same logic if it's a company doing it if it's a political party doing it or if it's a if it's an individual person doing it they function along the same lines and i think they also follow the same ethical model and that's very different from the traditional form of social interaction because in traditional social social interaction, there was basically no privacy. Still here in China, I live in China. I don't know what Abeba's cultural background is, but in many, many non-Western societies, privacy basically for many people doesn't exist. Like for instance, it's a story, it's a new story, it's a recent story that happened to me uh, about a year ago, maybe two years ago. I was talking to a Chinese student at dinner and I asked him, I never met the person, it was just small talk. I asked him, how was your, how was your last semester or so? And he said, oh, it's very bad. I asked why, and he said, oh, my roommate was sick. So I was alone in my room for the whole semester. Right, so he was very like suffering from the fact that he, that that he wasn't uh, that he that he was on his own, right? Uh, for of course, for from a Western perspective, uh, uh, this is uh, you know that would be we, we celebrate that that we have more privacy, but it's it's uh, from a historical perspective, it's a it's a very kind of new notion, and this this value for privacy, I can I think cannot be separated from the notion of private property and. So Secondly, it cannot be separated from the from the way we form identity because this is historically contingent. In traditional societies, identity was not formed in the way of basically creating a personal brand. So I think all these all these questions have to do with the question of identity, and that brings me to your question of authenticity because, of course, the modern logic of the Western logic of identity is the idea of authenticity, right? That we and authenticity means we're just not following any sort of social, we're not conforming to social expectations, we're not conforming to social roles. Everyone is supposed to be individual and unique. And that's how you basically become a valuable member, a valuable, a valuable person by developing uniqueness on originality. And the function of society is just somehow 
to basically empower this, to enhance this. But of course, that's inherently paradoxical because if you if everyone is trying to be original, then everyone becomes the same. And uh, uh, I think that we see this same paradox very much enhanced on social media. So the, the, the social media is basically a technology for enhancing this paradox and making it more and more visible because also the social media or social media, I always use the article the, which I shouldn't do, it's a German thing, sorry for this linguistic mistake. Um, uh, social media also provide this opportunity uh, purposely to basically develop uh, uh, authenticity, right? And actually, I read this uh, just recently. I find this very interesting in a German news report on the 10 most successful um, uh, influencers. And the, the newspaper article said, oh, the, 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 their key to success is their authenticity. Right, which is of course totally uh, wrong. Right, and then the authenticity was the then they was described what they meant with authenticity that they only make uh, commercials for brands that that suit their image. So again, it was it was totally about brand consistency. And so uh, that uh, I think again, just to conclude here, that the double bind of authenticity, which consists in that if you follow the command, be authentic, be original, you're already inauthentic and non-original, that this paradoxical double bind um, becomes more and more increasingly obvious through social media and such phenomena as influencers. And I think the same kind of paradox also becomes obvious in uh, the, the, the uh, issues that, that you were discussing uh, before the ethical issues. Thank you. Ibiba, do you want to add to that? No, I, I, I'll leave it at that. I, I very much agree uh, with, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, what Greg has, has said. Very good. So we're coming towards the end, and I, there are a couple of questions uh, that, I, that, I, I, that have come through the Q&A chat. But <clears throat> just to reflect on that, Robin, um, back to you, because in a way, your artwork deliberately raised a lot of these issues, uh, raised the issue around the, the values. Uh, and it's, in a sense, you are already interpreting all these images that were, you know, essentially the, the subconscious of Dublin Age and the notion of that authenticity or that faked authenticity, the double bind. Can you comment about the, you know, where there patterns within uh, what you what you saw were you were you self editing some of those those kind of images and and how you approach it? I'm I'm mindful of Ashling's phrase around the kind of the, the the intense labor of your work that this like this you just didn't switch and and wait for eight weeks that every night you were collating collab and interpreting those images with your yeah. kind of so I, I go on maybe. I mean it was normally I got it down to about tight ten minutes by the end of it. Uh, log in over VNC and just, I'd, I'd written a Python script that would download images throughout the day um, from Instagram. And then, so there was, it, yeah, I'd take out kids, dead people, which meant you'd have to like read the, the what had been written about the things I'm trying. There weren't many, only once or twice that happened. Um, but then it, there'd be like an aesthetic level, like some things I just knew weren't gonna look very good drawn through the laser like it, it worked really well with like high contrast images if you've got like someone posting quite an arty photo with like a sort of black background and like you know like a portrait where it's like really well lit um that i'll definitely take that and there were certain ones where it was just sort of if it was a particularly pants looking advert and i was like well it's just going to look rubbish <laughs> you've gone to all this trouble um of setting up this laser and, and setting up this camera so i'll just leave that one out um so i would pick I would sort of pick out the ones that I thought would look a bit rubbish. Um, and then the trends, I saw a lot of nail art. The people of Dublin 8 are mad for nail art. There's a lot of fingernails getting posted. Um, and, and tattoo shops. I think there's a tattoo shop down the road that's quite, quite prolific. Um, and then I think the other thing, it was, it was interesting getting knocked out of your normal social media bubble for that period. So instead of like... It, Doing what I would normally do is sort of browse my Instagram, browse my Facebook, and just seeing all the stuff that sort of confirms my own friendships, biases, and interests. Um, seeing sort of like this sort of weird God's eye view of a place, which you could, which is, which is 
odd because you could do that anyway. Like you could browse Instagram in that mode, but we don't because that's not the way the software sort of it's set up to make it easiest for us to do. So when we log in, the first thing it shows us is this you know, things that it thinks we want to see through this really opaque algorithm, which no one knows how, what it is they choose. So they don't, you know, it's not like it used to be the most recent thing that your friends had picked. Um, so it was, it was interesting sort of spending that time just looking at all, all this random stuff and sort of seeing a cross section of things that you wouldn't, wouldn't normally, but yeah. <laughs> I love that, you know, obviously you had like your limitations around the ethics of choosing to not show certain images, but also in choosing to not show certain images because they weren't interesting. You were being your own human Instagram algorithm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> curating or like upping the ones that are like slightly more um, uh, pleasing to look at. Very good. Uh, we have a question uh, coming in from, from, uh, from Q&A. Uh, Robin, do you think maybe that is not also an opportunity to challenge the importance to give to privacy and, 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 uh, as a concept that maybe this is a value link to a more individu individualistic contemporary society? Um, do I think it's a, or is it an opportunity to challenge privacy? I think it... It probably did. I, mean, I think sometimes we you pick ethics as I said, you've got a free choice to pick your ethics. Um, I think you have to be fairly because it comes down to like, are, are you going to get sued? I mean, also, also, how are other people then going to judge me for what I've done? So those are the two kind of systems that kind of feed back on have you made a good decision? <laughs> um, and I felt like I could just about well, yeah, you, I could defend it on the basis that these are images that they've already, they, these aren't people's private images, these are very much people's public images. This, you know, it is their idea of their public image. So, um, and I, I think the, the, the privacy thing, it's more about like what Gail was saying, in that you want them to really tightly control that public image. Um, and I think the tension, if there was going to be any, which there wasn't in the end, uh, would have, um, when I did it with YouTube stuff, it, it, it arose there, I think, because people don't like, they, they identify quite strongly with their, with their brand image. And then if you use that in a way that they haven't sanctioned, that's where the offense then, then lies. And is, um, you know, do we ultimately have a right to, to constantly manipulate how other people see us? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we have an artist in the room, um, Hugh McCabe, and he may have a question or a comment. I'll just pass the microphone on. I feel like talk show host. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you guys can't see me, I'm invisible. Um, <laughs> but my question is really for Abeba. Um, I, I think your work is great, really interested in it, and, and thanks for your talk. Uh, um, I, on the context of this, is I, I studied computer science many years ago, uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. And even though we were grappling with things like machine learning and computer vision and all these related technologies, I don't like recall a single conversation that ever happened about ethics or about bias or about, um, you know, uh, the impacts of these technologies, uh, positive or otherwise. And like, so obviously, a lot of things have happened since then, you know, we've got science and technology studies and critical AI studies. We've got lots of great kind of artistic interventions of the sort that Robin and Ashling are involved in, which are grappling with all this stuff. But like my question really is like, are those conversations, sometimes I worry that all these conversations are happening in kind of bubbles that are outside the actual development and deployment of these systems. So I, I'm just interested in your view and like anybody's view here about, is anyone listening? <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a great question. And yeah, I do sometimes wonder if, you know, my views are or if, you know, I, I'm really just in a bubble and nobody else cares about, you know, my research, what I'm saying, what I'm writing. So, yeah, that remains to be seen. I don't know. But in terms of, you know, thinking about the social consequences of, you know, computers, um, you know, ethical thinking or the push for, you know, incorporating social values has always existed. I think it just been, it has always been marginalized, even really, you know, very monumental figures such as, you know, Philip Agre, uh, Joseph Weizenbaum. He was, uh, he, he, he was, he was a, a German uh, computer scientist. He actually, he, he's, he created uh, Eliza, the first uh, conversational AI. Uh, and and from the 50s, from the start of the you know the the proper uh, computer or computer science or AI field, he people him and people like him 
uh, have been kind of pushing for, for ethical thinking in, in designing computer systems. And uh, I think I sometimes go back and read Weizenbaum's work and it just it's just as topical and it's just as relevant today as it was back then. Uh, so I guess this kind of like push for ethics has always been there. It's, it, it's just been on, on, pushed on the side. And now, uh, now my, my own view is that it has become a bit more mainstream because, you know, the models we build are no longer, they no longer stay in the lab, but they are ubiquitous, they are applied everywhere. They do impact actual people, real people. They have concrete impacts. Uh, people use computer systems to make decisions. So we can no longer just push aside, you know, the 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 negative consequences coming out of these ubiquitous systems. And also, it's evident if you look at, you know, whether it's Google, Accenture, Microsoft, big tech companies. They have ethical teams, even though they are they themselves are problematic. Google, for for example, has fired their own uh, both uh, colleagues of the ethical AI team, uh, and it's always problematic. It's always controversial to 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 talk about you know an ethics team inside corporation. Uh, but the point is, uh, you know, these are becoming a thing. Uh, if you within academia, if you look at computer science departments, even here in UCD, uh, we have we have started teaching ethics and critical thinking. Uh, you know, big universities, if take Harvard, MIT, Berkeley, they have all, especially over the past number of years, they have all adopted uh, ethics modules for computing classes. So I think uh, it's it's becoming more, more mainstream, uh, mainly because people have no choice but to think about ethical consequences because the, you, we, whether it's mainstream media, whether it's research papers, you hear again and again and again, you know, such and such have been imprisoned due to, uh, we, for example, we have three uh, black men that have been falsely imprisoned due to errors in facial recognition systems. You hear, you know, older workers are being excluded from ads. Uh, you hear there has been discriminatory consequences because of some kind of algorithm that's been used in, in banking or in, in social welfare or anything like that. It's just, there is no, you can't go a day without hearing this kind of negative things. So that has, to some extent, forced, you know, people, whether it's industry or, or academia, to, to, to think about uh, ethical implementation and designing of algorithmic systems. So I think it's, it's becoming mainstream. That's my, that's my personal assessment for sure. Thank you. And finally, Georg, to layer on that, to layer on top of that values and ethics is that the second order observation that what actually is truth right what actually what you know what is it that uh, i mean and that's i suppose one of the issues that robin uh, raised quite eloquently in his work was not only the like the kind of the subconscious around the, the ethics and 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 and, and values but what is it we're seeing, you know, and what, what, how are we, is it the intention of the, uh, the sender, uh, the, the, the creator of this image to, to, to see a particular reality that's obviously uh, can be often distorted? Well, well, it may seem that the ethics is kind of on the outside and then, you know, kind of regulating from the outside what is going on. But I think that's not the case. I think the ethics is inside and is in itself a part of the branding and the profile building. And I think that's why it becomes mainstream, as Abeba just said. You know, there is no big tech company that can afford not to be ethical. And why? Because it would harm its profile and because its profit consists in the value of its profile. And the same thing is the case at universities. There is no university that cannot afford ethics courses and to employ ethicists because it would harm the profile of the university and thereby harm the value of the degrees the universities are in fact selling and marketing. So it's not the case that the ethics is, so to speak, an outside regulator of this kind of discourse. It's, it's, an, it's an internal and very powerful uh, profile building mechanism. And branding mechanism. 
Thank you. So on that note, I just want to <laughs> finish <laughs> off. I think we've uh, we've we've um, we've given it, 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 it time, and I just want to thank the panel. I want to thank Georg and Abiba and Ashling uh, uh, for the commitment and involvement this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank um, the Digital Hub team who supported both the exhibition, the facilities team were amazing on this, uh, and the discussion, in particular my colleague, uh, Dr. Caroline Bigay, who managed and mediated uh, the work here for us. And finally, to pay tribute and thanks to Robin Price, artist and inventor for his art. Thank I, you. I'd like to thank John, who sat over there for setting up the IT, um, he, he made the entire installation possible, and uh, Sebastian uh, at Estates, he was amazing. Um, <laughs> he was very, very, very helpful around the risk and assessment uh, method statements. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and uh, let's hope we meet again uh, for further discussion. Yeah, and thank you, Abiba and Georg, for uh, getting in. It's really great hearing from you both. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.